this evening's speaker is Dale Phillips. He is going to be very entertaining if our table talk is any indication. Uh, he's currently superintendent of the Lincoln Home National Historic Site in Springfield, Illinois. And he's held various positions as historian, interpreter, ranger, unit manager, and so on at several different uh, national sites. He has written numerous articles on U.S. military history, not just the Civil War, War of 1812, etc., etc. And tonight he's going to be speaking on the Red River Campaign. Dale? Good evening, everyone. I, I have to warn you, since I'm being videotaped, that I unfortunately suffer from what I call Ed Barr's disease. I tend to wander from my notes. Uh, so I, I will try to stay as centrally located as I possibly can. It is a great honor to be back with you. I was here 12 years ago, and it's a tremendous honor as a Park Service Ranger and as a historian to join you once again. Uh, if the Mayans are right, and we're all toast a week from today, or a week from tomorrow. Uh, I cannot think of a better way to end my time on this earth than speaking to the Milwaukee and the Chicago Civil War Roundtable, which are always, I'm telling you, these are the two invites. You know you've made it in the Civil War talk, the speaking circuit. You get invited to Milwaukee and Chicago. Those are the, you've, you've made it to the big time. We consider that the greatest honor that can be bestowed on one of us. Just a a little bit of the start with a little, so throw a quick little funny at you. Uh, I came up on the train from Springfield, which now runs at about 110 miles an hour, which I wanted to see how well the high-speed rail was working. But it reminded me of a story earlier in my career, in my time in Louisiana. I helped develop a program called the Trails and Rails Program, where we put volunteers on Amtrak trains to serve as guides through many different areas. The first program we did was from Lafayette, Louisiana, through the Atchafalaya Basin and on into New Orleans. And I'll never forget during one of the first trips, the engine broke down right in the middle of the Atchafalaya Swamp, which is in the middle of nowhere. And the conductor comes on the intercom and he goes, folks, I got good news and I got bad news. So the bad news is the locomotive is shot. We gotta wait for a replacement. We're gonna be stuck here for a while. And he goes, the good news is you're not on an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Train travel has its advantages. <laughs> Coming up here today, I remembered that story, I'd forgotten it. What I'd like to talk to you about tonight is a campaign which doesn't receive a lot of attention because it's overshadowed by what's taking place elsewhere in the country during the Civil War. And that is the story of the Red River Campaign. When you think about it, I need you to go follow me with the maps. The first map will be an overview of, of the area we're going to be talking about. You gotta look at the situation in the late winter and spring of 1864. Grant is about to assume overall command of all federal forces, and of course his primary strategy is going to be to finally bring the full might of the federal forces against the Confederacy all at once, so they cannot shift their more limited resources to meet the different threats. Obviously, he will very shortly begin the overland campaign in Virginia. General Sherman will begin to assemble his forces outside of Chattanooga, and he will begin his march toward Atlanta. The other large federal force that is in existence at this time is referred to as the Army of the Gulf, under the command of former Speaker of the House, Massachusetts political general Nathaniel Banks. This army, they can't quite make up their minds. What, am I, what are they gonna do? They were presented with several different options. They could move on Mobile, one of the last few major ports still under the control of the Confederacy. They could move at Texas and establish a Union beachhead there. There are two routes into Texas. One is over land through Louisiana, and the other is by water, of course, through the Gulf and into places like Brownsville and Galveston. But in late 1863, they began probing for those different possibilities. They attempt to run into Texas by water first, and on September 8th of 1863, the Union attacking force is literally destroyed at a battle called Sabine Pass, near Lake Charles, Louisiana. So that's far, that first part fails. They then try to move over land, and just above Opelousas, Louisiana, at a battle on October 3rd, 1863, at a place called Bayou Bourbeau, the Union forces are attacked and routed 
and driven back to the town of New Viberia, located in the Lower Atchafalaya Basin in southern Louisiana. This is the stage as 1864 rolled around. Most of the Union hierarchy, including Grant and Halleck, do not want to move against Texas. Their preference is mobile, shut it down, shut down that source of supply. But Lincoln has his own agenda, and Stanton is pretty much in this with him. They want to get to Texas. Why do they want to get to Texas? That's the, that's the million dollar question right now. What is so important about bringing Texas under Union control in the spring of 1864? Anybody want to take a stab at it? There are several reasons. <coughs> oh, you got the hard one first. Did everyone hear that answer? No, no. There's a little thing going on down in Mexico. The French had come to visit in violation of the Monroe Doctrine. And it is very important to Lincoln to make a show of force on the boundary of the United States of Mexico in support of Juarez and the Mexican Revolt and letting the French know that the United States means business as far as the violation of the Monroe Doctrine. That's the hard one. What's coming up in 1864 that Lincoln would want as many territories as much land as possible, many st as much state areas under Union control as possible? The election. Get as much of Louisiana and Texas under Union control and possibly have them participate in the 1864 election, helping get reelected. And there's one other reason. What's going on in Tyler, Texas? Marshall, Texas? Well, the prison, but what else is there? A major munitions plant. There's huge amounts of armament, weapons, ammunition, clothing pouring out of the Texas area. They want that shut down. Now what is tied to that? If you missed the easiest one. I heard it. What's sitting all over the wharfs of Louisiana and Texas? Cotton. Lots and lots and lots of cotton. What are the New England mills screaming for? Cotton. And who's the commander of the Army of the Gulf? Banks. And where's he from? Massachusetts. Get in the drift? Guess where Banks wants to go? And there you have the story of the beginning of the Red River Campaign. Those are the reasons that that choice is made. And as my good friend Gary Joyner, in his book, I would love to title my talk after it, but he got to it first for the title of his book. He simply calls it One Damn Blunder After Another. And that's what we're going to talk about now. On paper, the Union battle plan looked pretty good. Sherman was ordered to dispatch 10,000 men of the 16th Army Corps, veterans of Vicksburg, under A.J. Smith, to come downriver from Vicksburg and assist Banks in his endeavor. William Franklin, who is now in command in New Iberia, is to march the 13th Corps and the 19th Corps up from New Iberia. They are to converge on the town of Alexandria on the Red River. Basically, it looks good on paper. And there's another part of the Red River campaign that does not get a lot of attention that I'm not going to talk about much tonight because it's a campaign all to itself. Frederick Steele is ordered to take another 10,000 Union soldiers out of Little Rock, Arkansas. And he is to come south through southern Arkansas and meet up with the rest of Banks' army at Shreveport on the Red River and there march a few miles, about 15 miles to the west across the Texas boundary and into the heart of Texas, primarily going after Tyler and the, they said the prison there and the munitions dump that's there, the armament factory. <laughs> on paper, it looks good. You add to that a fleet under the command of my favorite egotist of the Civil War, David Dixon Porter, a fleet of 21 warships and over 100 support vessels. It's a pretty good size force. On March the 10th, 1864, Smith's men and Porter's fleet will leave Vicksburg. By March the 12th, they have arrived at the mouth of the Red River where it enters the Mississippi River and they slowly begin their edge their way up. The first obstacle in their way is an earthen fort referred to as Fort de Russie, which still stands today. 
It has only recently been rediscovered and been completely covered over by growth. And the state has just recently acquired it and cleaned it up and uh, begun to interpret it as a historic site. It's a massive earthwork with a huge water battery that basically controls any approaches along the river. So what they have to do is near the town of Marksville, which I, I believe is on the map, right at the mouth of the river, just up in, from the mouth of the river. This earthen fort has a garrison of about 300 Confederate soldiers and contains at least 10 heavy guns, most of them aimed down the river. So what the Union fleet does is they arrive on March the 14th and they begin shelling the fort. At the same time, some of A.J. Smith's men are landed in the town of Smith at Simsport on the Atchafalaya River and they begin to march overland to take the fort from the rear. They arrive at the fort about 6 p.m. They storm the fort from behind while it's being bombarded by the river fleet and they take it almost without resistance. There are 38 Union soldiers killed or wounded in the attack and the entire Confederate garrison is captured. The first thing to give you an idea of how disorganized this campaign is going to be the first thing the Federals try to do is destroy this fort so it'll never be used again by the Confederates should they get back in their control. And I, I want to read to you how a Union soldier wrote about that demolition. They did a very bad job of it, this Union soldier would write. He's talking about the demolition now. I knew what it was in an, inst an instant, for I could see shells bursting high in the air, and the whole heaven seemed to be on fire. Pieces of timber and hard lumps of earth were falling in camp and even beyond. Men were running for life to the woods. There was a scary time to think before any other magazine blew up, followed by a shower of fragments. Two men were killed instantly and several wounded. But this gives you an idea of the disorganization that is going on and the lackadaisical attitude that some of the Union soldiers were having at this time. A.J. Smith's men get back on the transports and they continue upriver toward the town of Alexandria. In the meantime, Franklin's two corps have begun to march north from New Iberia. They leave New Iberia on the 15th of March and they go through some of the most beautiful country you could ever imagine, even to this day. They first, they march through the sugarcane plantations of the Acadians and the Cajuns in the lower Delta area. And eventually they will pass into the cotton fields as they get above Opelousas, they'll move into the cotton fields of the Red River Valley. They pass what is today the city of Lafayette, then Opelousas, and then on up to Alexandria where they will meet up with the rest of the Union forces. Porter's fleet will get to Alexandria first. They actually got there on the 15th. 180 sailors were landed without much of a fight. The city had pretty much been evacuated. There really is no Confederate force that could stand up to this kind of Union strength at this time. What do you think, when the city of Alexandria falls, instead of fortifying their position, what do you think the first thing the Yankee sailors start doing? Not celebrating, but we talked about it already. They're, they start going out in the countryside and grabbing every bit of cotton they can find. That leads to the following quote by a colonel named James G. Wilson. The sailors, Colonel, colonel Wilson would write, would go into the country five or six miles, find a lot of cotton, branded CSA and underneath USN. I recollect that I asked the Admiral one day, referring to Admiral Porter, when he did the honor of dining, of asking me to dine with him, if he knew what those letters stood for. He said no. I said they stood for Cotton Stealing Association of the United States Navy. <laughs> but this also led to bad blood. Banks himself would later complain in his own writings that the officers of the Navy, during the time we were there in Alexandria, were representing from day to day to the officers of the Army the amount of prize money they were to have received, which excited a great deal of bad feeling on the part of the Army. All the general officers urged me very seriously to arrest these men, make war upon them on the ground that they were engaged in a business that did not belong to the Navy at all. If any of you have a military background, does this sound like a command structure you want to put your life on for? I don't think so. This gives you an idea of how disorganized everything was. 
By the 24th of March, Banks has his full army assembled at Alexandria. Franklin's men will come marching in on March the 25th. He now has 36,000 men under his command, 90 pieces of artillery, and as I said before, 21 warships. Unlike the Banks of usual, he decides now to move with a great deal of speed, and he moves out quickly. And as he leaves Alexandria, a very important election takes place inside of Alexandria, and they elect a pro-union government. While Banks is busy putting this together, the army moves forward without much guidance. What they do are able to manage is they engage the Confederate cavalry that's available to watch the army at a place called Henderson's Hill. They basically surprise the Confederate cavalry and take control of the situation as far as the eyes and ears, if you want to call it, of the Confederate forces they are facing. This will deprive the Confederate commander, Richard Taylor, of this valuable resource for the first card of the campaign. The transports are loaded again, and by March the 27th and 28th, the full strength of Banks' army is on its way north. The opposition, as I said earlier, is commanded by General Richard Taylor, the son of the former uh, President of the United States and Army Officer Zachary Taylor. Richard Taylor, in my opinion, is one of the best general officers of the Confederate service. He has done very well up to this point fighting in the East. He is hated by his Yankee counterparts. His home just outside of New Orleans, to give you an idea of how much they hated Richard Taylor, his home just outside of New Orleans when it was taken by federal forces to see to it that Richard Taylor could never come back to it again. They took all the surrounding animals, including his kids' ponies, slaughtered them, and hung the carcasses up inside the house to rot. Uh, that building still stands today. The carcasses are gone, of course, but that has been cleaned up, and that is still a, pri is a private home just outside New Orleans today. But there was a great deal of dislike for Richard Taylor. Richard Taylor has very few resources available to stop the oncoming Union force. At the most, throughout his entire district, he could have put together maybe 16,000 men and 60 pieces of artillery. So you can see, even if he brought everybody he had together, he still would have been outnumbered at least two to one. Taylor decides he's, gonna, he's not going to fight. He's going to continue to pull back. But there's another problem. Anybody remember who Richard Taylor's commanding officer is? Where's, where's my trivia, boss? Yeah. How well did Taylor and Kirby Smith get along? They hated each other's guts. So basically, Kirby Smith is telling Richard Taylor, oh, just let the Yankees keep coming. Don't bother fighting them. Maybe say, you know, bring your men up here. We'll take care of Steele, who's coming down from Little Rock. And maybe we'll go back and deal with Banks. Well, Richard Taylor does not take very kindly to this. Some very, very nasty notes go back and forth between the two officers. And Richard Taylor basically disobeys his orders and decides, no, I am not going any further than Shreveport. Most of his men are Louisianans. This is their home. He is a Louisiana. They are going to stand and they are going to fight, win or lose. The bad blood between those two officers is going to play a direct role in what's going to happen in the next few days. Eventually, the Union forces, unopposed, will reach the town of Natchitoches on April the 1st. Here is the first really big blunder of the whole campaign. All up until this point, Banks has had his men on either the river transports coming up the Red River, or he has stuck basically to the river road under the protection of those warships. This is one of the great mysteries that we don't have an answer to even to this day. There are two possible things that happened here. Banks, at this point at Natchitoches, either got so overconfident that the Confederates were not possibly going to attack him, instead of continuing to follow the river road under the protection of his warships, he decides to move 20 miles inland and to go up a single dirt road, which I'll describe to you more in a few moments, and move on Shreveport from the south through this single road through the Piney Woods. And what's going to happen is going to be a disaster. Now, why did he decide to do this? Was it overconfidence? But recently, a new story has begun to surface that Gary Joyner's been working on. It is very possible that 
the Confederate, the guides that were assigned to Banks were actually Confederate sympathizers, and that this was actually plotted out. That they failed to tell Banks that the River Road was passable, and they, they, they talked Banks into moving inland, knowing he would separate himself from the protection of his warships. They're still digging on that one. Is it, does it make sense? Very much so. Could very well have gone that way. He places Banks, places 2,500 of his men on the transports and sends them on up the red. And as I said, he takes his army off 20 miles inland into the Pine Barrens. The entire force is on the move again by April the 6th. Let me describe to you what a Union soldier wrote about those barons. A Yankee cavalryman called it a howling wilderness. The narrow road, parts of which were merely a sunken woods path resembling a deep, broad ditch, wound over hills of red clay and sand. Pine thickets pressed in from either side of the road like the walls of a corridor. The few buildings passed on the way were crude affairs of clay pine poles. Water was almost non-existent, except which fell from the sky on the 7th and turned the road into a rusty mud. Banks honestly believed, at least I believe, that the Confederates were not going to pose any threat to him in front of Shreveport. The way he aligns his troops on this road is a recipe for disaster. Out front is the Union cavalry under, ironically, a Union general by the name of Lee, no relation to the Virginia Lees. Then there are several hundred wagons on this one lane road, the cavalry's wagons, before you get to any support infantry. And then behind that first wave of infantry are 700 more wagons before you get to any more infantry. The column was over 20 miles from front to back on this single dirt road. You see a recipe for disaster coming? Well, Richard Taylor did, and Banks did not. <clears throat> On the morning of April the 7th, Union cavalry just outside of Pleasant Hill begins to meet stiffer resistance. Tom Green's Texas cavalrymen had arrived from Texas, giving Taylor, finally, eyes and ears. They began to start putting up a stiffer resistance as Taylor begins to assemble an army he can just south of the town of Mansfield. General Lee, the Union Cavalry commander, sends word back to General Franklin that Confederate resistance is stiffening. I need help. Get infantry up here. And Franklin basically blows him off. Where do we, where do we remember William Franklin from? And what did he, what was he basically responsible for in McClellan's army? What disaster? Mary's Heights. Yep. That's how he got shipped west. So obviously, William Franklin pays no attention when Lee is telling him he is also bought into this idea that the Confederates are not going to fight. And so he does not, at this point, send infantry to help the cavalry. Green eventually <coughs> delays the Union advance long enough for Taylor to assemble his force south of Mansfield. He gets about 9,000 men into line of battle backed up by about 60 pieces of artillery. Colonel T.R. Bonner of the 18th Texas Infantry described his feelings and those of his regiment as they marched through the little town of Mansfield on their way to take up their position on the line of battle. As we passed through the streets of the beautiful town, we were thronged by the fair ladies, misses and matrons, who threw their bright garlands at our feet and bade us, in God's name, to drive back the Yankees and save their cherished homes. As their cheerful songs of the sunny south fell in accents of the sweetest melody upon our ears, we felt that we were indeed thrice armed and thought greatly, and though greatly outnumbered, would drive back the foe. On the morning of April the 8th, 1864, the Union Cavalry enters the south end of that large field south of Mansfield. Lee looks out across that open field and he is stunned by what he sees. He sees these 8,000 Confederate soldiers drawn up in line of battle waiting for the oncoming Federals. 
he again sends a request back to Franklin, get the wagons off the road and get your infantry up here. Franklin again blows him off. It isn't until late in the day when Banks finally arrives on the scene that he says basically, hey Franklin, get the wagons out of the way and start moving your infantry up. We have a problem. But by then, it's going to be too late. Eventually, about 4,800 men of General Landrum's division of the 13th Corps. Now remember, these are not these are not Eastern unbattle hard. These are these are Vicksburg veterans, the 13th and the 16th Corps, part of Grant's army. These are not these are battle hardened veterans that are about to go into action. Landrum's division does get up to. If you go look at the map of the battlefield, it may. everyone hear me? If you look at the battlefield at Mansfield, the alignment of the federal troops is not very good. They basically go into an L-shaped formation facing the Confederates across that open field. What they don't realize is that they are outnumbered almost two to one, and behind them the road is completely clogged by those wagons and other upcoming infantry. It is a nightmare about ready to happen. Eventually, about four o'clock in the afternoon, General Taylor is finally ready to attack. Oh, it bends the door now. All right. That's a first. By 1 p.m., oh, let's see if we can get it fixed. I think I probably killed the battery. Basically, by 1 o'clock, the federal troops have come into position. By 4 o'clock, they will begin to receive the attack of General Taylor. Mouton's division, General Mouton, the son of a Louisiana governor of Cajun ancestry, will lead the attack. <coughs> they will swarm across his division, will come across that open field, and these, the, these veterans of the 13th Corps will hold their position. They will drive back the oncoming Confederate forces with heavy losses during this first part of the attack. But eventually, more and more Confederates will come into action on their, their left and right, Eventually, they will overlap the entire Union position and begin to collapse it on itself. Now, one of the reasons we study this great conflict so closely is what happened to me one day as I was standing at that very, I had a tour group that I was taking from around the country, and I had, I had a group of about 50 people, and I'm standing right where that L is, and one of the people in the group speaks up, and he was a direct descendant of the Kentucky, I believe it's the 19th Kentucky, uh, that's right there on that L. And also in the group, a young lady <coughs> speaks up and, well, my ancestor was in the Crescent Regiment of Louisianans. And they're right against each other. At this moment on this battlefield, their ancestors fought each other face to face. And here, all these years <coughs> later, they are, never one had ever, neither one of them had ever been to this spot. And here, these many years later, I had these descendants back in that one spot. The battle now becomes a Confederate, the Confederates completely rout the Union line. They are so heavy in number, they get around the Union flank, there aren't enough Union reinforcements coming up to strengthen the line, and slowly the line begins to give way. Oh, we got another one. General Mouton is out front leading, oh, sorry. General Mouton is, I'm gonna lower the voice again. Joe, we interpreters just, we're not used to having my amplification. Basically, General Mouton is out leading his men, and an example of how desperate this fighting is, his men talk about how a group of about 35 federal soldiers tried to surrender as the line collapsed. General Mouton rode up and told his men to stop firing, basically take them prisoner. But then a couple of the federals picked up their rifles and they shot General Mouton right through the heart, killing him instantly. Uh, one of his officers then wrote how all of his men then picked up their weapons and there were very quickly 35 dead Federals laying around General Mouton. And so the Confederate General loses his life at this moment on the battlefield at Mansfield. More Union troops are coming up in from reserve. As you look at your map, you'll see that they tried to form a second line a little bit further to the rear. This is Cameron's division of the 13th Corps, about 1,300 men, now up against 8,800 or more Confederates coming at them. It, it, it's a, it, they're easily overwhelmed and they also are routed, leaving behind their artillery and are driven back. 
The Confederates will pursue them as rapidly as possible, and what becomes a mass confusion and retreat down that one lane dirt road. I want to read to you what one of the Union soldiers wrote about this moment in the battle. Still thicker and denser came the frightened crowd, wrote one soldier, rushing past in every possible manner. Men without hats or coats, men without guns or accoutrements, cavalrymen without horses, artillerymen without cannon, wounded men bleeding and crying, every step, at every step men begrimed with smoke and powder, all in a state of fear and frenzy. We, we, while they shouted to our boys not to go forward any further, for they would all be slaughtered. The road was almost blocked with wagons, caissons, mules, and runaway horses, while Negro teamsters and cavalrymen were driving directly through their ranks. So you can get an idea of the mass confusion. But now luck enters. Technically, the Army of the Gulf should have been destroyed on this day. That Confederate force would have kept sweeping down that road and should have destroyed all of Banks' units piecemeal. But now a bit of fate and luck is going to play. One of the reasons Taylor has had such difficulty in keeping an armed force together is he could not keep them supplied. Now, all of a sudden, these hundreds of Union wagons full of supplies have suddenly fallen into Confederate hands. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, they're going to stop and eat and grab whatever else they can out of these wagons. And for the next couple of critical hours, it takes the Confederate officers about two to three hours to get their men back into line of battle as they pillage these wagons. These two to three hours this late in the day are going to prove crucial. Because about two miles, if you look at the, the second Battle of Mansfield map, you'll see a third line. This will be established about two miles back from where the main battle has taken place. This is General Emory's division of the 19th Corps, over 5,000 men strong. By the time the Confederates reach that last line, darkness is coming on. They do try to assault the Union position, but by this point, they are just worn out, they're beat up, and they are repulsed by those 5,000 men of Emory's division. As darkness will end the fighting that day, Emory will hold that position well into the dark, and then he will eventually begin to follow the rest of the retreating army about 12 miles further back to what is today the Plown of Pleasant Hill. The Battle of Mansfield, or Sabine Crossroads, as it's called by the Union forces, is over. Basically, about 12,000 Union soldiers got into that battle. 700 of them are killed and wounded. Over 1,500 of them are taken prisoner. They will lose over 20 pieces of artillery and over 200 wagons. Of the Confederate 8,800 or so engaged, they have fewer than 1,000 men killed and wounded together. So you can see, and over a third of those are in Mouton's division from those frontal assaults at the beginning of the fight. So you can see it is a tremendously lopsided battle, and it basically should have resulted in the complete destruction of the Army of the Gulf. But scavenging through those wagons bought them enough time for the Federals to reorganize. <coughs> On the morning of the 9th, Emory has completed his withdrawal back to the rest of the army at Pleasant Hill. There he will join A.J. Smith and Banks' staff, and they will make the decision to stand and fight. And now will come the largest battle of the Red River Campaign, the Battle of Pleasant Hill. If Banks had made enough mistakes already, if you look at the alignment of the Union forces at the Battle of Pleasant Hill, it is about as bad an alignment as you could possibly ever place your troops. You see Shaw's division, Shaw's brigade, completely out in front on the main road, completely detached from the main force. You see Benedict's brigade to the south, completely separated from the main Union line. You see the Union reserves nearly a half mile to the rear behind what is a ridge. You can't see the ridge, obviously, on the map, but there's a ridge between them and the town of Pleasant Hill. All these units are disconnected. That area around Pleasant Hill, except for the farm fields right along the road, is basically extremely gully, ravine, big ravines, heavily wooded. And if any of you have ever hacked your way through the Louisiana swamps and lowlands, you know there's 
growth and snakes and critters and all sorts of, it, you just don't go walking through the woods in Louisiana on a spring day. It's as dumb a terrain as you could possibly imagine. This is what the Confederates see when they arrive at Pleasant Hill. It takes the whole day for Taylor to get his army organized. He has been reinforced now by Churchill's division. He's still got Walker's Texans. He's got his Louisianans. He's got a pretty strong force of battle-hardened veterans. And he chooses about 4 o'clock to make another frontal assault on the Union force. This frontal assault goes about as well as the one at Mansfield the day before. Shaw's brigade is immediately cut off and sit browned. Led by the 32nd Iowa, they basically fight in a circle. And remember the old Napoleonic squares? Well, they basically form a square. As the Confederates swarm around them, Shaw's brigade fights with one regiment basically facing in each direction as the Confederates completely cut them off from the rest of the Union force. Benedict's brigade, Benedict is killed. His brigade is completely routed, destroyed, and driven back through the ravine behind him, back toward the main line. These Confederates from Texas, Missouri, Louisiana, Arkansas, completely rout the forward Confederate force. But then luck is going to play again into the Union hands. The brigades of Dwight and McMillan are up on top of the ridge at the north edge of the battlefield. They finally stop the main Confederate thrust on the northern part of the battlefield. The town of Pleasant Hill was a town of maybe 50, 60 buildings. It was a very small community. Uh, this point in the fighting is the Confederates sweep into the town. McMillan and Dwight are behind it, and the fighting becomes basically hand-to-hand, -hand, house to house, building to building. Now what's neat about that battlefield today is it's all farm field. It's all owned by a single family. Most of it's all owned by one family. And you get there, you can still see the city streets, and you can still see where the buildings were. But what happened to those buildings is a story all to itself. After the war, when the railroad came through, they moved the railhead about two miles away. So as it happens with so many towns, the town of Pleasant Hill without a railroad faded away. But they took it a step further. They kind of picked up the town and took it to the railhead. And so the town of Pleasant Hill today still contains a lot of the same buildings that were on the battlefield on this day in 1864. So it's kind of a neat story. They actually took the town to the rail instead of the rail coming to them. And so what you see today is completely open field. I want to read to you a quote of a Union soldier in the 153rd New York by the name of Lyons Wakeman, who is involved in this fight. Lyons would write, our army made an advance up the river to Pleasant Hill, about 40 miles. There we had a fight. On the first day of the fight, our army got whipped, referring to Sabine Crossroads, and we retreated back about 10 miles. The next day, the fight was renewed, and the firing took place from about 8 o'clock in the morning, started about 8 o'clock in the morning. There was heavy cannonading all day and sharp firing of infantry. I was not in the first day's fight, but the next day I had to face the enemy bullets with my regiment. I was under fire for about four hours and laid on the field of battle all night. There were three wounded in my company and one killed. And he goes on to list the different injuries. I feel thankful to God that he spared my life, and I pray to him that he will lead me safe from the field of battle, and that I may return safe to my home. Remember Private Wakeman. It's going to play an important role in my conclusion. As the Confederates continue to rout the Union force, the entire southern part of the attack, Churchill and Walker's men, basically sweep the town free of, of, of the Union soldiers. But now that ridge I mentioned earlier comes into play. A.J. Smith had assembled all his men from the 16th Corps behind that ridge. And if you look at the map, you see a perfect disaster for the Confederates about to happen. They swept through the town thinking the Federals are in front of them, <coughs> while off to their right is this ridge, and behind it are all those soldiers of the 16th Corps. They will come sweeping over that ridge and catch the Confederate line completely in flank and completely routed and begin to drive the Confederate forces back. 
At the same time, Dwight and McMillan's brigades will counterattack, and they will begin driving back the Confederates on the northern part of the field. Eventually, they will pick up the remains of Benedict's brigade, and eventually they will rescue Shaw's brigade, which has been fighting totally surrounded for the bulk of the afternoon. The Confederates will actually be driven back about two miles, during which they will recapture the Federals' will, a lot of the equipment that they lost the day before at Sabine Crossroads. Darkness will soon end the fighting. About 1,200, a little over 1,200, uh, excuse me, a little over 12,000 Union soldiers are engaged. About 1,200 are killed or wounded or captured. The Confederates actually got about 12,000 men, we think, into this fight, and about 1,400 of them are killed, wounded, or captured. Now Banks has to make a decision. He's lost at Sabine Crossroads. He's won at Pleasant Hill. What is he going to do? Well, spring is coming. And then he gets a note which cinches it from Admiral Porter out on the Red River. One of the things that can we believe the Confederates did is they had begun to break the levee around Shreveport, and they had begun to funnel water out of the Red River, dropping the water level to a dangerous point for the Union warships. They also took a steamer, and they placed it lengthwise across the river and sunk it smack dab in the river. The, 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 the legend is that they actually hung an invitation to a ball that evening uh, to, to Admiral Porter on the boat as he approached it. But there was no way for the Federals to get past this blockage. And so Porter sends a note off the bank saying, I cannot get past this, this wreckage. Uh, I don't have the ability to destroy it. What do you want me to do? And Banks now realizes he's getting low on food, water in this part of the country, as you heard from that one, you heard from that one Union soldier earlier in his quote, is very hard to come by. And so he makes the decision, Banks does, to order Porter and his army to begin their withdrawal. They will slowly begin to pull back toward Natchitoches and toward a place called Grand and Corps, where they will try to regroup and decide what to do next. Taylor is not going to let them go easily. Taylor really wants to destroy this Union force if all possible. What he does is he takes his men and he goes after Banks. He sends General Tom Green from Texas and his Texas cavalrymen after the boats. And one of the strangest battles of the Civil War will take place at a place called Blair's Landing, 45 miles upriver from Grand Encore, which is the rendezvous point for the Union forces. Two of the retreating Union ironclads with the following falling water levels will run aground, so they're stuck out there in the middle of the river. Green dismounts his cavalrymen and orders them to charge the ironclads. Yeah, it's, it, it's a little humorous, but it wasn't for those poor Confederates, I'll tell you that right now. Those ironclads just ripped them to shreds. Did they ever get to the ironclads out in the river? Probably not. Very early in the attack, General Green has his head taken off by a cannonball. So the attack ends pretty quickly. Eventually, the Union ironclads do get back. But can you imagine in for dismounted cavalry charging? They, I think they had four field pieces with them, too, if I remember correctly. But can you imagine dismounted Texas cavalrymen charging three <coughs> Union ironclads? That had to be one of the strangest scenes of this entire conflict. They eventually, the ironclads refloat and they continue on their way back to Grand and Corps. Once there, Banks has to make a decision. Does he continue to retreat, or does he attack? This is where Kirby Smith comes back into the picture. He is furious that Taylor has disobeyed his orders and stood and routed Banks and sent him reeling. He immediately issues orders for the recall of almost all of Taylor's troops. He will recall almost all of his fighting force that Taylor is probably left with less than 5,000 men. Basically, you're going to have about 5,000 Confederate troops left to face at least 25,000 effective Federals. Not very good odds. Of course, Taylor has to obey these orders, and he sends his troops off to Arkansas, where eventually they do defeat Steele and drive him back to Little Rock. But in the meantime, Taylor is not giving up completely. Banks now realizes with the Red River dropping to dangerous levels, and I've actually, we talked about it at the dinner table, I've actually been on the Delta Queen and tried to get up to Shreveport, and we ran aground. 
That's how shallow that river can get even today. And so you can imagine what an ironclad or a warship. By the way, they couldn't turn around. After they got to that steamer, there's not enough room in that river to turn around. They're backing out of there. Can you imagine driving a car backwards for miles after miles after miles? This is what the Union Navy is going through. It was not a good situation. Taylor basically decides he's going to trade. He made one attempt to stop the Federals at this point. After they leave Grand Corps, Banks has made the decision that he's going to retreat back to Alexandria. Taylor is going to try one more time at a place called Manette's Ferry, which is a series of hills where the Cane River crosses and it goes into the Red River. From those heights, he places about 1,600 men and several pieces of artillery. In the floodplain below, as they leave Natchitoches, he watches Banks deploy his whole army in perfect parade order getting ready to assault across the Cane River and up these heights. This is a decoy. Banks has finally wised up a little bit. His men are able to find a ford upstream. They cross the Cane River. They sweep up to the Confederate flank, and they rout those 1,600 Confederates before they are able to <coughs> take on a frontal assault. And so the Battle of Manette's Ferry ends very quickly with the Union victory. The Union troops are able to cross the Cane River and continue their retreat toward Alexandria. Now the Yankees are ticked. A soldier in the 114th New York wrote the following about this moment in the retreat. Destruction and desolation followed on the trail of the retreating column. At night, the burning buildings mark our pathway. As far as the eye can reach, we can see in front new fires breaking out, and in the rear, the dying embers tell the tale of war. Hardly is a building left unharmed. The wanton and useless destruction of property has well earned A.J. Smith's command a lasting disgrace. In order that the stigma of rendering homeless, houseless and homeless, innocent women and children may not rest upon us, be it recorded that not only the commander of the army, but our division and brigade commanders have issued orders prohibiting it and threatening offenders with instant death. Now you can see, even between the Easterners and Westerners of the Army of the Gulf, the tension is rising. On April the 27th, everybody is back in Alexandria without any further resistance. Now comes one of the most amazing stories of the Red River Campaign. We've talked about it earlier in the evening. The Army can basically march away anytime they want to. The Navy has a real problem. There is a series of limestone rapids, limestone ridges in Alexandria that the naval vessels have to get over in order to continue their trip downstream. When they arrive, the fleet, they find only three feet of water over these rapids. They need seven feet to safely get across those warships, get across those rapids. Ten warships with a value of about $2 million are trapped. Porter is getting real nervous that the Army is just going to march away, abandon him, and leave them, the United States Navy, to their fate with the oncoming Confederates. Who enters the picture? Colonel Bailey. Joseph Bailey. Bailey. From where? Wisconsin. Yeah, from Wisconsin. <laughs> he is going to be the Union savior on the savior on this day. He's an engineer attached to General Franklin's staff, and he basically comes in and says, guys, I'll build you a dam. And your giggling is exactly the reaction he got the first time he brought it up. But as the situation becomes more and more desperate, the Federals are willing to try anything. And so Bailey is given permission to build his dam. Work will begin on May the 2nd. And this amazing feat, which eventually will involve over 3,000 men, 200 wagons, 1,000 horses and mules, all begin to work on this dam. It will be 758 feet long and will have to hold back a current of about 10 miles an hour. The soldiers immediately begin stripping everything in sight on the, 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 the pine, the, the, the north bank and the, the city that's there and Alexandria on the south bank. They have Pineville is on the city on the north side. They cut down every tree, they strip down every house. The, south, the dam coming out from the south side is basically what I would call cribbage, into which they throw rocks, they throw kitchen ovens, they throw any of the stoves, anything they can find goes into these cribs. 
On the north bank, they use what is called reverse tree. Uh, they basically cut down trees, they point the limbs upstream so it'll catch all the debris coming down and begin to build that, that wing of the dam in that method. Eventually, the wings will begin to close toward the middle. If you look at the last map, uh, on the last page, you'll get an idea of where these dams were, uh, how it worked. What is really neat about this part of the story that again shows how the Union forces are finally starting to get their act together, there are African American soldiers and Union soldiers from Maine primarily building this dam. Several of them will be swept away and will lose their lives building this dam, but here you had black and white soldiers in that water together building this unique structure. It's kind of a unique story right there. Eventually by May the 6th, there is four feet of water behind the dam. By May the 8th, there is five and a half feet of water. And by that afternoon of May the 8th, several of the smaller vessels are able to slip into the pool behind the main rapids. By, the, by May the 9th, Banks is getting a little ticked <coughs> off. He's looking out at Porter's ships, and he notices in the whole time they've been there, they're not getting any lighter. They're still sitting in the water as deep as they were when they got there. What do you think, Ben? What do you think Porter's been doing? You got it. None of the guns have been taken off. None of the armament have been taken off. And every hull is full to the brim with cotton. Banks and Porter have a tremendous blow up. And Banks says, you want to save your carcasses, get that stuff off your boats. And eventually they do strip them down, which will be decisive in what's about to happen. As the dam is closed, they bring barges full of debris out and close the gap, getting ready to build up that pool the busted loose to allow the Union warships to get out. But then at 5.30 in the morning on May the 9th, the dam broke. About a 100-foot gap is torn in the dam, and it's a, because the water is rushing through so fast, only the Lexington is able to get up enough steam and steam through the gap and get into the lower pool. The other vessels are still trapped upstream. Bailey cannot plug the gap. He's got to come up with another plan. And so if you look at your map and you look upstream to the left of the page, you will see two more wing dams, which was Bailey's solution. Basically, he created the world's first water slide. Think of it that way. You're thinking about a water ride. You've got, this dam, you've got two sets of dams now, two sets of wings, funneling all the water of the Red River straight down this slough. Think of it as a, 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 an early water ride. And that's exactly what happens. When those two wings are completed, it finally puts enough water in the main channel for the ships to move. By May the 12th, there is enough water in that slough between the two wings, two sets of wings, for the Union Navy to move. At 6 a.m. on May the 12th, the run begins. Morning of, by morning of May the 13th, the entire fleet is safely over the rapids and on its way down the Red River. By mid-morning on the 13th, the Union Army marches out of Alexandria, leaving it in flames. There are hardly any pre-Civil War structures left in Alexandria to this day. The remains of the dam are actually still there and at very, very low water, which doesn't happen very often because there's now a series of locks and dams on the Red River, you can still see some of the remains of the wings coming out from the different banks. I've had a chance to see them during a, a drought. On May the 16th, as Banks is continuing his retreat towards Sibsport, Taylor will make one more attempt to stop it. On May the 16th, at a place called Mansura, on the Opelousas Plain, he will assemble about 5,000 soldiers at 32 with 32 pieces of artillery. They'll put up a good show. They'll actually fire a few rounds. But here you have 5,000 men across this wonderfully beautiful open plain. And out in front of him come 25,000 federal soldiers who also deploy in line of battle. And Taylor, to his credit, says, yeah, I don't think this is a real good idea. They fire a couple of artillery rounds and then get the heck out of the way, and Banks is able to continue his retreat. They get to Simsport on the banks of the Atchafalaya River. If they get across the Atchafalaya, they will be safe. 
But then they discover they've made another critical error. There's something missing when they get to the Atchafalaya River. Anybody want to guess at what that is? A bridge. There's no way across the river. And so enter Joseph Bailey once again. Bailey comes up with the idea of taking all the support transports, lashing them together, and basically making a bridge of steamships over 700 feet long across the Atchafalaya. They laid planks across the decks of the steamships, and over that, the Union soldiers will make their final escape. The oncoming Confederates make one more attempt to smash the Union rear guard that same day at a place called Yellow Bayou, just outside of Simsport. It's a sharp little quick fight, but the Union rear guard holds its position and drives back the attacking Confederates. The 69-day campaign is over. Union losses during the campaign come to a total of roughly 8,000 men, a little over 8,000 men. They lose over 60 pieces of artillery, one ironclad, two tin clads, and five transports. Wow. Confederate losses in this campaign will be about 6,000 men and three small vessels. So you can see numbers-wise, it really doesn't match up with the great struggles that we look at in the East and the Atlanta campaign during this time. So you can see why it got completely overshadowed. But it allows the Confederates to hang on to Texas, hang on to northern Louisiana, which they will until the end of the struggle. What happens to our key players? Well, Banks is finally, it's, they're done with him. Banks, like other political generals, is basically, he goes back to New Orleans with what's left of his army and is basically placed on the shelf never to be heard from again as a military commander. What happens to Richard Taylor? He gets promoted. And in one of the more interesting stories of the Civil War, because the Union warships control the Mississippi River, he is given command of all troops in the basically the Alabama, uh, southern Georgia, Alabama, eastern Mississippi district. He gets to the Mississippi River in Louisiana, and they have to sneak him across the river in a rowboat. So you can imagine, here's, a, here's now, who's soon going to be a lieutenant general in the Confederate Army being rowed in a rowboat across the Mississippi River. He will take command of those Confederate forces, and in May of 1865, he will surrender those forces, the last Confederate forces west, or to be east of the Mississippi River, still uh, resisting. What happens to Joseph Bailey? You folks can't answer. What happens to Joseph Bailey? Well, he goes on to become a general, fights in the Mobile Campaign, receives the accommodation of Congress for his saving the Union Navy, basically, and then resigns from the Army. He becomes he's the sheriff of, I believe it's Vernon County, Missouri, if I remember correctly. <coughs> Does anybody know what happens to him in Vernon County, Missouri? He's shot in the back by a prisoner attempting to escape, I believe is the story, if I remember correctly, and killed. And apparently he rests in Fort Scott, Kansas today. I did not know that until just a few moments ago. And so that is the story of Joseph Bailey and what happens with him. As a conclusion in the story of this campaign and the waste to sum it up as accurately as I can, is the story of Private Lyons Wakeman of the 153rd New York. After fighting in this campaign, after, after having fought in this war for several years, in the, in the, well, first in Washington and Virginia, and then in New Orleans, Louisiana, Private Wakeman survives the retreat back to Alexandria. There, Private Wakeman suffers an attack of diarrhea. diarrhea. By May the 3rd, is so stricken Private Wakeman has to be put uh, first a, a wagon and then a steamboat and makes, makes that, has to make the horrible rough trip all the way back to the hospitals in New Orleans between the 7th and the 22nd of May. Private Wakeman is so sick when he gets to the hospitals in New Orleans, he is basically placed aside to wait to die. He dies on June 19th, 1864 and he is laid to rest in the Chalmette National Cemetery with thousands of his fellow Union soldiers. 
Now that might be the end of the story, but again, this is why we are in this business. Shortly after I left Chalmette and I went out to Acadiana to begin building a series of cultures, cultural centers, the young lady that replaced me at Chalmette frantically called me on the phone one day. She had a family in her office, and they were asking about how do we get the name on a headstone in the National Cemetery changed. The name that was on it was incorrect. That happens all the time. I said, well, you, you get a hold of the VA, you fill out this form and that form, you send it off to the VA, and they will manufacture a new stone and they'll send it to you. And I could hear her trembling, I could hear her someone right and she goes that's not the problem I said, what could it possibly be she Sarah Wakeman was the individual's real name one of the few proven solid cases of a woman serving as a soldier in the Union Army and since that time a whole book has been written about her I have a copy of it, you'll be to look at it later. What was really neat about her story is that she sent home, she was the oldest of 11 children in a poor family from Eastern or Western New York, excuse me. And she went to work early in life as a canal, working on the canals, dressed as a man to earn enough money to help support her family. And when the war broke out, all her buddies on the canal all joined up and she went with them. There are all sorts of wonderful stories. There's actually a commendation from our company captain for her beating up the company bully. So this is one tough lady. And she continued to serve all the way up until the final sacrifice of her life. But it shows you an example of how things were at that time period, more than any example I've ever seen of the conditions and the chaos of the Red River Campaign. Even in death, her identity was not discovered, nor was it revealed. All the letters that she had sent home, because she was kind of looked at as sort of the black sheep of the family,